This is the story of some students who studied abroad and came in contact with a culture expressing itself far beyond its home in the South Pacific. This journey starts a world away and ends up in Vermont with the unveiling of a beautiful present. But the real story is older and greater than any piece of art that can be bestowed. The name Aotearoa, which is the Māori name for New Zealand, it came about when the great ancestors, when they first came to New Zealand, Kupe was the captain of, of one of the canoes, the first person to arrive to New Zealand. A woman on his boat looked out and saw there was a long cloud formation, and she uttered the words, He Aotearoa, a long white cloud. And so the name of New Zealand became Aotearoa, the land of the long white cloud. The Māori lived undisturbed in New Zealand until the 17th century, when Europeans first made landfall on the island. Suddenly, their lives were very different. The British colonized New Zealand, seizing land from the Māori and killing those who stood up to them. The Māori lived for years under British rule, forced to assimilate at the risk of losing their cultural identity. Younger generations didn't want to be Māori for fear of punishment, but in the 20th century, a movement started for the revitalization of Māori culture. My name is Jason King and I teach Māori development, I teach Māori leadership, I teach Māori language. And being Māori means that we can say where we come from, who we are, why we are, and how we got to be here. And simply the word just means to be normal. Kia ora, ko anahira tōku ingoa, my name's Anahira. And I teach Te Reo Māori, so I'm helping the revitalization of the language. A marae is like a huge complex. It includes the whare nui, what you see behind me. Uh, for me, the marae is a place for the community. I really enjoy bringing people into the Māori world and like breaking their preconceived conceptions of what Māori are and who they claim to be. We're not just people who are savages, who are natives and who would eat people and all these, all these stories that would come out. We're actually kind people who are hospitable and who actually are quite clever with the way we do things, um, who are inspiring, who encourage others to learn their own culture. And it's no surprise that most of our classes are filled with non-Māori people wanting to learn Māori language and Māori culture. Protocols, customs, you name it. People have started to strip away their goggles of colonisation to um, really look deeper into what the Māori culture is all about. I just hope that they feel a sense of belonging to the space, that they're always accepted and welcome. That's all I want every, anybody to feel when they come, when they're officially welcomed onto our marae. My grandparents lived in an age where they were abused for practicing their culture, for using their language every day. The concept of genealogy, your family lineage, and that is the most treasured possession that you could possibly have, and pass that knowledge on, hold those memories of those ancestors fond. My dad never spoke to us in the Māori language. So he went to a native school. He was beaten at school by the teachers for not knowing any English. So he hated, he hated education, he hated schooling. Hence the reason why he didn't want us to learn the language because he didn't want us to go through that same beating. It was a real despondent time when our parents were going through their development. There was the stigma that being Māori was not cool and infiltrated the majority of Māori families to the point where they felt that if they put their Māoriness to the side, things would be better because being Māori is being poor and being underrepresented in politics and having the lowest paid jobs is because you are Māori. Uh, I felt something missing in me um, that I longed for. So when I heard people speak, 
are saying, hey, that's, that's me, but I, I can't do that. Why can't I do that? 100 years ago, you would never see this place here in a mainstream university. Now, many universities have a marae as a space for people to come and celebrate the Māori culture, not just for Māori, but for everyone. So these sorts of things are also indicators that we're in good stead, heading in the right path. We should be sharing our knowledge to make the world a better place, to make the world global citizens, to make the world change agents of the future. There's no difference between the Māori people, indigenous Māori people of New Zealand, to the First Nations people in North America. If we look at places like Vermont, we have the Abenaki people right there at your doorstep. This bond between the Māori and other indigenous cultures is something Jason works hard to maintain and is part of what brought him and others halfway around the world to Vermont. The connection came about because one of the deans at Champlain wanted to bring some of the Māori culture in New Zealand to America and share that with our community in Vermont. My role really was from the trip that I took to uh, New Zealand, went to visit Auckland University of Technology. We felt that it was important to bring a Maori artist to Vermont to do a carving using native wood and to connect with the Abenaki community. That idea came about, then we picked the carver, and the carver whose pahi and his work is immaculate. So what's one meter? Kia ora, uh, my name's Pahi. I'm from a small town in Aotearoa uh, called Hawera, and I teach Māori wood carving, indigenous art. And then a piece of... the, the search oh, for the wood uh, was yeah, a long mean, search. It took about a year. And eventually I was led to the wood shop at Shelburne Farms. The artist, Pahi, had never seen the wood, so there was this implicit trust that it was going to be the right piece of wood, and it turned out to be. And we were able to proceed with the blessing that needed to happen prior to the first cut. It's important for me as an artist to uh, share the art of Whakairo, the art of Māori wood carving with anyone. Who wants to know about it? To acknowledge the Abenaki people is imperative for us as Indigenous peoples coming into other people's lands. But those lines of communications are now starting to open where they never were before. During Pahi and Jason's visit to the US, they met with the Abenaki tribe of Vermont for a weekend of celebration and discussion. This bond influenced Pahi's carving. And after weeks of work, it was time for the unveiling ceremony. Uh, the Pari Whakairo symbolizes the close connection and foundations that have been fashioned through AUT and Champlain's relationship over the many years. It also recognizes and acknowledges the indigenous people, the Abenaki, and how our values, beliefs, and traditions are very much interconnected. <laughs> We are here, we are this little people in the South Pacific, but we hold on to our values, strong within our, our teachings, our, our protocols, and our, and our language. That's why I'm doing what I'm doing, that's why I'm going global. Because the more people I can teach, the higher the survival rate. These people who I am teaching are going to be educators, they're going to be leaders, they're going to be CEOs, they're going to be managers, they're going to be influential people in the world. And so if I can get in front of them and talk to them about what we do as Māori, as Indigenous peoples, then maybe there's hope for them to pass on that same gift to others within their own communities, to other Indigenous peoples. For the Māori, it's a remarkable turnaround. They've gone from being known as victims of discrimination to people who are unafraid to speak up and share who they are. But despite the progress they've made creating these connections with unfamiliar people, their struggle's not over. Even today, indigenous cultures like the Maori and the Abenaki deal with issues of discrimination and must cope with a system built to keep them out of power. We are continuing that fight. A lot of Maori are still continuing to be recognized. I think 
the survival with our culture and of our language will be in our grandchildren's grandchildren. So I, I look to the future with uh, not a heavy heart, but a very uh, with good and lovely anticipation of what, what's to come.